Welcome to our webinar, uh, our UC Retiree Learning Series webinar on water issues facing Northern California. We're sponsored by St. Paul's Towers. My name is Betsy Barron and I am the Marketing Director at St. Paul's Towers. For those of you who are not familiar, we are a continuing care retirement community near Lake Merritt in Oakland. So right now I'm going to introduce Carrie Sweeney, who is the director of the UC Retirement Center. Carrie? Yeah, thanks Betsy and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks especially for Professor Resch for joining us today. A little background um, as to the Retirement Center and St. Paul's Towers relationship. We successfully started uh, this learning series um, pre um, pre-COVID, uh, where we would be hosted generously at the St. Power Towers community. We have a chance to take a look at some of the retirement communities in the Bay Area, like St. Paul's, um, kind of take a look around the walls, and then hear an interesting lecture and learning. And the real aim that we got the started was <clears throat> to encourage um, some learning opportunities off campus for people. So we're sticking with that for sure. Everyone is joining us today off campus, but also a chance to learn about what is long-term care and um, retirement communities in the Bay Area. What does that look like? And just to start those conversations um, in your family about these, these topics. So we are very thankful for St. Paul's to want to partnering to continue this series via Zoom. It's been incredibly popular. We've, um, as you can see, the numbers are high today and have um, and continued to be high with Professor Resch's presentation. So thank you for joining and being here. I would have the pleasure of introducing uh, Vincent Resch, uh, who's been professor in environmental science policy and management at UC Berkeley uh, since 1975. Professor Resch has been an advisor to the World Health Organization and other United Nations organizations for over 20 years in evaluating the hum human impacts on water resources and developing countries for Asia and Africa. He has also served on various science advisory boards on water issues in California. He's received the University of California's Distinguished Teaching Award and has taught about issues related to water and environment to over 20,000 and I think more plus adult learners uh, at Berkeley graduates. So um, without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to Professor Resch. So uh, Betsy and Carrie, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, you know, this talk was originally scheduled to be in April, uh, and then sort of everything fell through as, as we know. And uh, uh, although this is a rather apocalyptic morning uh, looking out the window, uh, it turns out that this is actually quite better uh, to talk about this issue now because of two recent incidents, one of which happened last Sunday when the San Francisco Chronicle ran a full uh, article starting on the first page, going for several pages about the Delta, the San Francisco, uh, the, the Sacramento San Joaquin uh, Delta, and mainly from the point of view of the residents that live there, because that's one of the big topics that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, the other was is on uh, August 31st, I uh, stepped down after 10 years on the uh, uh, state. Uh, independent science board dealing with water issues, especially water going through the Delta. And uh, it's actually, I feel much uh, more comfortable now uh, talking about these issues because not representing the board or anything else, it can't be construed that uh, this is the official state position. So I feel I can, I can talk multiple sides of the, uh, of the various issues that come up. So thank you again, and I'm gonna go ahead and start my slides. And I hope all of you can see this. This is a title slide, Water Issues Facing California. You'll notice that I actually had changed the title from Northern California because, you know, the, the water system in California is so integrated that it's really difficult to talk about Northern California without talking about Southern California and the implications for both. But if you can look at the, the graphics that I have on this first slide, uh, these really deal with 
San Francisco Bay and the, the Delta. Now, under the Obama administration, the number one environmental issue in the United States was the San Francisco Bay and Delta area. This was the number one concern of that administration because of uh, all of the issues of environmental problems of water supply and everything else. So we're really talking about an extremely important issue. And actually, when we talk about water issues, one of the biggest issues is the issue of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta that flows into San, San Francisco Bay. Now, we use the term estuary really to describe that whole Delta uh, Bay system where freshwater meets uh, salt water. And, and this is the area of concern. So of course we look on the, uh, uh, on the, the far side, we see the, uh, an aerial photo of, uh, uh, a satellite photo of San Francisco Bay and the Golden Gate Bridge. And then the, uh, the slide on, on my right is of uh, the kind of oh, the channels that make up the Delta where the San Joaquin and the Sacramento flow in together. And as you can see from the bottom left slide, you, you have these islands that have been created by levees with open water areas and then areas that have been diked and used for, for agriculture. And then this, uh, you see, of course, there's commercial species such as crayfish, fish, uh, and a variety of other things that we co see coming out of, the, out of the Delta. Now, when we talk about California water, there are big issues, and they're all big issues in the Delta. And in fact, the Delta is the center of most of these. First of all is drinking water quality. Uh, if any of you have ever lived in Southern California, you know how many people there depend on bottled water. They don't drink tap water because of the, the taste of the water, the salty taste or the mineral taste that's very, very common in a lot of uh, Southern California water. Um, this is, of course, the fact that you have so much evaporation and uh, water that's coming through the Delta can be salty as uh, depending on the time of year. Uh, but also it's been very interesting because people in Southern California are willing to pay quite a bit more in terms of, of, of the actual cost, maybe 50 to even 100% more for their water if it was, was better tasting. So it's a big issue. It's even a, a bigger issue for water quality in terms of agriculture. There, the salts, the fact that the way agriculture is done in that fields are flooded to leach the existing salts out, basically just increases the amount of, of salt water in the irrigation drain. So salinity is an important problem for drinking water in terms of taste, but it's a really important problem for agriculture. Uh, the endangered species of fish, you know, if you believe in the rule of law, these fish have been given federal protection and there are five species in the Delta that are directly affected by activities that go on to, to address water in California. Um, levee protection is without a doubt the biggest issue in, in uh, the Delta, to, at least to me. Um, the levees were built to really no standards, agricultural standards essentially, over a hundred years ago, starting in the, in the early 1800s. And the idea there was that you're reclaiming land, uh, which is ironic because sometimes when we talk about reclaiming Delta land now, we're talking about putting it back into tidal marshes or into freshwater marshes. But the Delta levees are really a big issue. The, the approach has been to basically build levees like pyramids. You build them wider and you build them taller. Uh, and the argument has always been that we're worried about levee failure due to floods and especially due to earthquakes. Uh, one of the ironies is, is that you look at levee failures that have occurred and they're what are called sunny day failures. Uh, it's not during a flood, it's not during an earthquake, it's caused by burrowing animals, especially ground squirrels. And of course, the big fear now is nutria, the beaver rat, which is a, a, a very, very powerful burrow, a burrower is in, the, uh, is in California now, has been here for, for quite a while, but the numbers are increasing and they're expanding their range. Um, it's kind of an archaic system about how the levees are protected uh, now, they, besides the construction, what you find is that uh, you know you have a couple of guys going a, a, along a thousand miles a, of levees a week and uh, either trapping or shooting ground squirrels because that is the biggest problem that we have in terms of le levee failure. Uh, state and federal environmental legislation have a huge 
impact uh, on the Delta. First of all, there's the Endangered Species Act, but more important is legislation that's coming out of California. And I'm gonna talk about uh, this uh, in, in detail, but again, all of these issues are centered in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. So the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta is critical for California water. About 27 million people or about two thirds of California residents rely on this for drinking water, but even more important is its use in agriculture. About 45% of the fruits and nuts and vegetables are from the Delta for the entire United States. So that uh, uh, through Delta water, excuse me, not in the Delta, but through water that, that passes through the Delta. Uh, agriculture in California uses about 80% of the total water available. Um, one of the things that you often hear is that 80% of the water is in Northern California, but 80% of the use is in Southern California. Uh, likewise, 80% of the commercial fishery is, uh, is based in the Delta through San Francisco Bay, and including the five endangered species, its habitat for over 700 uh, vertebrates and uh, important species that way, birds and, and mammals. Now, I, I want to kind of just talk about agriculture in California just for a minute. Uh, one of the things that, that I often do when I talk about, uh, about agriculture in California is to ask a general question as to what proportion of the California economy comes from agriculture? In other words, what percent of the uh, gross domestic product of California comes from agriculture. And if this was a, uh, you know, a, an auditorium like we would have had in April, I would have said, okay, how many people think it's above 80%? How many people think it's above 50%? How many people think it's above 25%? And so and so, so and so, less than 25%. So what I'd like you to do is just take a minute in your own mind to come up with a figure. What percent of California agriculture is from, uh, uh, the GDP is from agriculture? Now let's also add in uh, the, the um, processing. So for example, the processing of milk, the processing of nuts and things like that. Uh, let's not add in trucking because that's too complicated. Let's not add in uh, uh, supermarkets and the sale. But what percent do you think of California agriculture is represented in the GDP? The answer is it's less than 2%, less than 2%. Agriculture in California is a big business, but when you think of it relative to the entire state economy, and you think of Silicon Valley and uh, Hollywood and all the other, the air, aircraft industry, I mean, it really is a small percent of the, of the economy. And one of the questions that regularly comes up in a water starved state with water that's gonna be uh, uh, less in the future, how do you, justify 80% of the water going for less than 2%. Maybe some of that will come up in the comments. Okay, so Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta is critical to California. Now the Delta is place, and the, you know, this is really something that I'm gonna mention over and over again. Uh, the Delta's place has about a half a million people. It's uh, agriculture is about 2 billion in, in gross value. But it has a lot of people coming in for boating and, and fishing. Uh, many of you that live in the Bay Area probably know the Delta from, you know, you're taking the scenic route to, uh, to drive up to Sacramento. And of course, one of the things that happens when you do this, you notice as you're driving along, if you look at the left, assuming you're <laughs> driving to Sacramento, uh, you see the level of the river up here. Uh, you go to look at the right and the level of the land is down here, the tremendous subsidence that has occurred there. And this is why these levees are so important because the levees keep the water out of the, uh, out of the agricultural fields. Now, if we look at the historical compared to the current Delta waterways, if you look at the early 1800s, this is when the levees were starting to be constructed, the islands for agriculture were being, quote, reclaimed. What you see is that there's like a series of anastomosing rivers and a lot of little creeks and a lot of overland flow of water. But if you look by the time you get to the late 1900s, what you can see is a lot of these small areas and the, uh, the, the flooding has really disappeared. And what you have is a lot of channels. In other words, you have islands of, of land surrounded by, by water that has been constrained, that has been uh, uh, confined into various levees. So if we look at water flowing into the Delta, 
So the, by the way, the Delta, you know, if you think of, of Sacramento as kind of the northern extreme of the Delta, and then everything from the, uh, there on down, uh, that, that's what we talk about the Delta. And of course, the shape of a Delta, uh, we all know from the Greek letter. So if we look at water flowing into the Delta, about 80% of it comes from the Sacramento. 80% comes from the Sacramento. This is very, very good water quality. 5% comes from the East Side River, rivers, the McCollumy, the Tuolumne, again, good. Uh, but the other thing to remember is that there's tidal influences that occur twice a day, and this brings in ocean water into the bay. And depending on the time of the year, it moves that ocean water upstream. So in the wet season, it may take uh, uh, a day from, say, water in the delta to actually flow into the bay. In the dry season, it may take about 30 days. So there's this tidal influence that's very, very important. Now, the other thing that happens is that the inflow is from the San Joaquin River, and this has poor water quality. Uh, in part, at least, it's because of draining agricultural fields in the Central Valley. Uh, its outflow, uh, on average, 65 to 70 percent, let's say 69 percent in an average flow a year, goes to the bay. Uh, in Delta use is about 7 percent of that water, and the Bay Area, the Central Valley, Southern California gets roughly about a quarter. And again, this is, a, this is an average depending on different years. Now, one of the things I want to mention right from the beginning, when we talk about water flowing through the Delta going to Southern California, Southern California starts at Fremont. San Jose depends on water coming out of the Delta. Now, they have some reservoirs, some sources, but when we talk about water going to Southern California, for, out of the Delta, it really is starting in, uh, in, in uh, Fremont and San Jose. Now, I mentioned a lot of water goes to the ocean. Now, you can look at this in two ways. If you're concerned about, uh, you know, water shortages and, uh, you know, the, that's the, the maximizing use of water, we have the idea that the water is lost to the sea. Well, I mean, arguably, because of economic reasons, it's too costly to store. Uh, and it's too uh, hard and, and costly to divert and capture in the wet season. But actually, the main reason is that we need water going out to keep that salt water coming into the bay from moving upstream. So we use a, an awful term. We call it environmental water. Actually, the environmental water is really to keep the salt water out. And only, a, you know, a cup, one to two percent is really used in terms of maintaining water for fishes. So it's a very, very bad term that we've been stuck with, this environmental water, because the water is essential to maintain freshwater passage through the, the delta, which is then shipped uh, for drinking water. Uh, so a, again, following that, fresh water has to be flowing year round to prevent the salt water intrusion, the salt water from moving up into the delta. And then What's left goes to maintain the agriculture and the ecosystem, uh, providing urban use, roughly 80% uh, agriculture, 10% industrial, and 10% domestic use is what we find for California water. And actually, this is pretty much true of every developed country in the world in terms of the distribution of, uh, of water. So if we look at historical conflicts that have occurred in the Delta, uh, one of which is, is the idea of restoring the e Delta ecosystem. And here you have competing demands both on how much water and how good the quality of the water is. So I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you still have to have low salinity water for agriculture. Uh, one of the things that we see in, uh, uh, in, in California now is, you know, nut production is quite high is the shift from almonds and walnuts to pistachios. And the reason is pistachios can grow in saltier water. So we see, and, and, and during the drought, for example, hundreds of thousands of trees were, uh, were planted uh, higher up in the, in, the, uh, in the valley than before. But again, uh, with the idea of uh, perennial crops being so important, and we'll get into that a little later. Uh, the endangered species, the flow reductions, and the actual shifts in the direction of flow, because the pumps will draw water in if there's not enough water maintaining the flow out to the, to the bay. Um, water supply reliability, um, the issue uh, that really is one of the take home messages, there's not enough water for everything. People are gonna get less water. The 
ecosystem is going to get less water than they want, or maybe even that they need. Uh, there is not enough water to go around. And so this is where we'll see compromises taking place. Uh, the water quality, I've already mentioned Southern California water uh, standards for drinking water, but also for agriculture. And again, the fact that we have this uh, process of flooding the fields to drain the salts out so that the soil can be productive and levee failure threaten agriculture and urban uses. In the United States, among the top five security risks uh, that the government has identified, levees are one of those five. The failure of those levees would be a disaster. And I'll show you that uh, in a, a couple of slides down. down. The other thing is Delta is place has become very, very important. You know, Delta has a couple of historic towns, Walnut Grove and Lock, the old Chinese communities. It's kind of a charming place to, to visit. You have old ferries that are crossing the Sacramento River. You've got, you know, kind of speakeasy type hotels like the old Ride Hotel in, in, in Ride. And this has really become a big issue of preserving this, this unique part of California. And, and it really is, the Delta is a unique part of California. Uh, but one of the things we find in water in general, and we can start at the battles of the Klamath River, where it was farmers against salmon, and you know, hundreds of thousands of salmon died uh, when water was cut off in the, in the early 2000s. And that is that when you talk about water in California and talk about agriculture, you've got to talk about the third component. In the Delta, it's Delta's place, but what it really comes down to is way of life, maintaining a way of life, even if it's not profitable, for example, in the Klamath uh, agricultural area, uh, is maintaining that way of life. And a lot of the uh, arguments, a lot of the, the uh, disagreements, and a lot of the, the stonewalling, it really is about Delta as place or the maintaining a way of life. So what are some of the problems that we see within the Delta that are gonna affect uh, agriculture? And this actually goes into the, the Central Valley as well. Continued subsidence within levees. Five to 25 feet are already uh, evident in terms of compaction of the soil, erosion, oxidation. And then the groundwater pumping, which is a big issue that I'm gonna come back to, that also produces more subsidence. So you can find areas in the Central Valley where it's actually 30 feet uh, below where it was uh, in terms of the, of, of the level. Sea level rise, sea level rise is real. In the Delta, we're counting on 55 inches of sea level rise, including surges. One of the things that's been important about sea level rise is not just looking at the effect of a few uh, centimeters or a few inches, but realizing the effect that this has, the magnifying effect on the surges that are produced during sea level rise. Uh, climate change, uh, 2050, a third of loss of snowpack, increase in intensity, uh, frequency of, of winter runoff, and of course there's greater variability that uh, I'm going to again come back to this in terms of droughts and floods, but there's increased variability. Uh, invasive species, I've already mentioned nutria, you know, and uh, the delta is really a, a perfect example of invasive species because you have species that are very valued, bass for fishing. Remember the striped bass is not a native species in the, uh, in the San Francisco Bay. It was brought in from the, from the East Coast. Uh, nutria, this very, very damaging beaver rat. Uh, and of course, human population growth. Uh, we have periods where the population decreases in some areas, increases in other areas, but all of these will increase the demand for water. Now, Delta smelt is probably the iconic, this little four inch uh, long uh, fish that is one of the endangered species. Because if you look at the long-term trends in Delta smelt, uh, what you see is that the, uh, the numbers really started to go down in around 2004, 2006. Uh, and what we see is the, uh, the, the, the rise in other areas and then the decline. And if we look at this in terms of other pelagic species as well that are endangered or important, such as the striped bass, economically important, we see this decline that's occurring in numbers. And this was referred to as the pelagic water decline or the open water fish decline. Uh, and this is really what uh, uh, caused the Endangered Species Act to actually look at the protection of these species and suddenly bring the individual species into the, into the environment. Um, 
Uh, one of the questions that undoubtedly comes up is, um, you know, who cares about this Delta smelt? It's, uh, you know, about uh, four inches long. It uh, supposedly tastes like cucumbers, you know, but, you know, who really, who really cares? Well, again, if you believe in the rule of law that this species is protected and this is considered something that we have to, have to uh, help maintain its survival. Uh, currently, there are huge, um, like uh, those little swimming pools that are set up in people's backyards, maintaining uh, populations of Delta smelt, mainly for research, but also for potential restocking. Uh, this was done in uh, the Rio Grande River uh, for the stocking of the Rio Grande silvery minnow, where it's basically you create a little fish zoo uh, to try to keep the population alive. The problem is there's almost no genetic variability. Okay, and again, this is the uh, organism decline that you see. Uh, one of the initial ideas in terms of protecting the Delta smelt, and actually uh, under the Schwarzenegger administration, was one of the big pushes, and that is habitat is a substitute for more water. So that if you increase habitat or you improve habitat, you make uh, things better for these species. And again, you can see the size of uh, of Delta smelt with uh, increased habitat improvement, in this case, making you know, uh, more turbid water, deeper water, uh, having higher levels of, uh, of phytoplankton ended up producing uh, greater growth. This is the big thing I wanted to talk about when I mentioned levee failure. What ends up happening with levee failure is you have salt water entering into the Delta where fresh water is currently being passed through. Currently, the way the Delta works is that water is coming down from the Sacramento, it's coming from the San Joaquin, it's flowing through the Delta, and then down by Tracy, there are federal and state canals where, that distribute the water, and the pumps of those pull the, uh, um, the water through, and also, unfortunately, pull fish through as well. But if you look at this scenario, where you're looking at uh, a levy, a major lever, levee break that floods an island, what ends up happening from that flooding you have in the bottom slide within 24 hours, intrusion into the delta itself, saltwater intrusion. By the way, the um, conductivity is simply a measure of, of salinity. It's an easier one to think of because it's, it measures the electrical current going through the water. Uh, so then 24 hours, you have it intruding into the delta. Once to seven days is throughout the delta. By the time you get to 30 days, if that levee can't be repaired, you have a saline estuary with no water that's of good enough quality to be shipped for either drinking or agriculture going anywhere south. And again, south starts in Fremont. And again, I mentioned this is one of the top five security risks. Here is an example of a breach that we saw uh, recently. And again, you know, this was a case of flooding, but usually the breaches are sunny day failures. And here we see levees uh, up on the top um, where highly channelized, highly constrained water by levees that are at water level on the left, or on, depending on which way you're driving, and then uh, 15 to 20 or 25 feet below. Okay, so one of the huge legislative advances that was produced came under uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was government, a Republican administration. This was the Delta Reform Act of 2009. Now, what this established were co-equal goals. And I know if there's any uh, former English teachers in the audience, you know, how can you have co-equal goals? They, they just would be equal. But they thought that this would give emphasis to the fact that uh, both of these are important. First, to protect and enhance the unique cultural, recreation, natural resources, fish, and agricultural value of the Delta as an evolving place. And the other co-equal goal was water reliability. Again, not as much as you want, but match water use to water availability. The other thing that was part of this was the restoration of the Delta. And this was a huge uh, amount of money that was allocated to this. But ultimately, the cost was going to be for the users would pick up the cost. In other words, the people that are using the water out of the Delta and, of course, the pollution of it. So that you had uh, the best example is the uh, ammonium removal that's at the Sacramento treatment plant, uh, which was in the uh, 
well over a billion dollars, multiple billion dollars, actually, if you, you think of the main maintenance and everything else. And this is the idea of improving the water quality with ammonia being considered, and at least by some of the, the that passed the legislation to push this as one of the pollutants. Okay, so let's look at what's called today the Delta Con Conveyance Project. This is commonly known as the tunnels. Okay, and I want to give you the little bit of the history of this because it's changed over time. Uh, from 2006 till 2015, and again, this was started by Governor Schwarzenegger, the idea was to have what was called the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. This consisted of two tunnels and a huge restoration project. The price tag of this was well over $60 billion. This was the biggest uh, uh, engineering development project in the world. Uh, it, a lot of it was going to, towards restoration. Uh, it was a, a huge project, $250 million was spent for the environmental impact report and the, commission, the state science board that I was on, uh, our responsibility was to be one of the primary reviewers of this plan uh, and the impact assessment the statement ran 67,000 pages. We spent over a year uh, going through this. 2016, 2018, there was a new idea. Uh, again, I've never thought this term was the best possible term to use. Governor Brown started something called Water Fix. And basically what it was to do was to separate the restoration from the actual uh, creation of the conveyances that brought water to, to Southern California. Uh, it was a twin tunnel, uh, very, very similar to what was in the Bay Delta Conservation Plan of, of Schwarzenegger's, but the restoration was, was separated. And actually, this was approved. Um, I, I should mention Governor Brown is very, very interesting. You know, there's been a lot of, of uh, reappraisal of his four terms as governor, as, as mayor of Oakland. Uh, governor Brown's father, uh, Pat Brown, really in the 1950s, started the greatest water movement project in the in the world. And it's been kind of generally accepted that during his last term that uh, Go Jer Governor Jerry Brown wanted to see this finalized, that his plan for this was the Twin Tunnels. So 2017-2018, the uh, uh, Environmental Quality Act approves the uh, uh, water fix. All of a sudden, 2019, California Department of Water Resources, who's the lead agency on actually building the tunnels, withdraws the request. Now, there were huge numbers of lawsuits. It was an incredible political story because uh, Governor Brown had pressured um, some of the, the board of directors into Metropolitan Water District into approving payment of this. Uh, it just, you know, kind of old fashioned California politics went into it. Uh, but it was actually quite surprising when uh, this uh, uh, water fix was, was withdrawn. And in 2020, uh, our current governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, changed the name to the Delta Conveyance Project. And the idea, so it replaced the Bay Delta Conservation, it replaced water fix, with the idea that there was one tunnel, a single tunnel. And this was really quite, quite a shift. Um, and we can talk about that. Uh, the figures that uh, I have, again, looking at the Delta, the, the, the just incredibly complex rearrangement of water that's, that's being done there. Uh, if you drive through the Delta at all, one of the most common things you'll see are no tunnel signs, and that's true today, that the people in the Delta have been very, very opposed, at least the most vocal people have been opposed to the, to the tunnel. And again, we can talk a little more about that. And then that middle bottom slide is a, a, a clip from the movie Chinatown. If you remember uh, John Carradine uh, playing a wealthy landowner in the uh, Mulholland story of the, the diversion of the Owens River. Um, it's, a, it's a great movie to watch and uh, uh, it's, it's still uh, very appropriate to, to what happens in terms of, of California water. So if we look at the Delta Conveyance Project, this is the single tunnel. Uh, the argument is in response to sea level rise, climate change, seismic risks, et cetera. And the reason they do this, and I've only shown one of the, the, uh, the proposed tunnel routes, is actually an alternate route uh, to, the, uh, to the east. 
uh, mainly because the with the uh, impact assessments, what you have is you 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 need alternatives, and including an alternative that there's no no project that a project doesn't go ahead. But the pro proposed water intakes, uh, and there's three of them in this in this scenario. There was two in in Browns are up by Freeport, which is just. Uh, uh, below Sacramento. It's a, it's a wine growing region, a uh, lot of fruits, a lot of fruit trees as well. The tunnel is actually 150 feet below the surface and is about 35 miles long, hooking up through this Clifton Fort Forebay where the water comes out to the uh, state and federal pumps then onto the aqueducts uh, taking water uh, south. One of the reasons that the brown uh, or excuse me, Brown wanted the two tunnels and Newsom the single tunnel, is that you eliminate the problem of levee failure, at least to the point of the major one of the flow through going through. Uh, because you're taking water from higher up in the Sacramento River, it's less salty than, uh, than it would be if it goes through the Delta. And, um, you know, the, uh, um, the seismic risk, the, the, the levees are gone. So the argument was that in terms of these two big risks of, of, and problems, the salinity and the seismic risk, you're really solving that problem, the salinity because you're taking fre fresher water. Uh, the really unsure thing about improving aquatic condition, uh, uh, many of the, the excellent fisheries biologists in the state, including academic ones, are split as to what will happen. And this is large because you've never really seen anything done like this before. Uh, the argument is with increased water, you will have the flow. Um, uh, you won't be using the Pope's pumps to draw as much water in. You won't have the shift of flow towards the pumps during low water. Uh, but it, one has to admit, it really is kind of an unknown whether it'll improve aquatic condition. The price tag of this, as I'll talk in a minute, is about $17 billion just for the tunnels. Of course, that you know, if we look at other projects we've had in the state, that's a ballpark figure, and undoubtedly will will go up. All right. So again, this is kind of summary of potential uh, environmental consequences of less water in the delta. Well, water movement, as I've talked about, if you don't do anything, you're going to keep on grinding of fish, including endangered species, in the pumps. Uh, the salinity change is going back and forth. Uh, the idea that this would be a little it would be muted, it would be uh, ameliorated quite a bit. There's another problem uh, is that the, the food for fish, including the endangered species, is really affected by introduced species. The Asian clams uh, filter a tremendous amount of water. If you uh, look at a video of where the Asian clams start to appear in terms of their uh, quality, and you look at the, the algae, the phytoplankton, that's the basis of the food of the zooplankton and the fish, you notice that as it passes through these Asian clams, it looks like clear, clear water, is that they're sucking up and they're filtering so much of that. Uh, there's also this toxic algae that's forming, and again, during low water periods. Uh, the algae name is microcystis, but you probably have heard of how these harmful al algal blooms or HABs. Um, you know, plus there's pesticides coming in and everything. Now the toxics thus far have killed a few dogs, but you don't find much in the way of human deaths unless there were um, uh, compromised conditions that this may have played a role. But this is again, a really big issue in terms of less water in the Delta. Uh, and th this of course would happen with if uh, large amounts of water are taken in the pumps. And of course, uh, one of the big ones is the habitat loss uh, and how that can be recovered. All right, what I wanna do is concentrate now on the current solutions and give you some of the issues that each of them uh, raise. Um, where Governor Newsom is using a term that's, I, 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 it's a likable term, it's better than water fix and everything else or uh, co-equal goals. That's, we have a portfolio approach to water. Now the portfolio approach is gonna involve water conservation. And one of the things again, uh, when I, I was t telling some friends that I was doing this, this talk, they said, ah, Southern California is stealing our water again. Well, you know, if you look at the average water consumed by a resident of Northern California, it's about 85 uh, gallons a day, okay? And that includes lawns and everything else. If you look at it in Southern California, it's about 92. But actually Southern California was much, much higher 
Southern California during drought conditions has been much better on reducing water use than Northern California. And I, I think that's, you know, there's sort of an urban myth about, about uh, uh, that, um, you know, because you see golf courses and swimming pools, but in terms of personal water. And again, remember the big issue with water is agriculture. Uh, domestic use, you know, you can listen to, you know, public service ads saying, don't leave the sink going when you're brushing your teeth. But the big issue is agriculture. And I'm gonna to go to that in one of the next slides. Uh, and again, better conveyance of water through the Delta. Okay, um, this is the single tunnel, 20, 35 miles long, 150 feet, 150 feet, 150 feet below the Delta. And then that goes to the state and the federal uh, water distribution systems. Um, storage, increased storage. Uh, we're never gonna be building large dams in California again. We're not gonna see another Shasta Dam or another Oroville Dam. That's not gonna happen. These are smaller dams that uh, are being modeled in terms of where they can be located for the, uh, the best distribution, but it's, we're not talking about big dams anymore. But we are talking about increased groundwater storage, and that's another point that I'm going to come to in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, desal, actually, I'm going to end up talking about desalinization. Reuse of water. Uh, this is a big thing in some countries. You look at Singapore, you look at Israel, they are reusing 85 to even 95 percent of their, their water. Uh, again, we'll look at this in a second. Uh, I think one of the things that's inevitable is taking land out of agricultural production. Uh, we already see the shift of nut trees going from the south to the north, uh, the shift in the type of, of nut trees. Um, you know, it, this is sort of a, a, a little bit of an of a exaggeration, but you know, every time you eat an almond, you're drinking three to five gallons of water. Uh, they're very, very intensive. Perennial crops tend to be very intensive. Uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, of water use. The big thing that's happened, that this is really new, uh, and, and whether this is going to work or not, is, is it's very hopeful, and this is the voluntary agreements. In other words, that you have the environmental groups, the conservation groups, the non-governmental organization, the agricultural groups, getting together and trying to decide how water is going to be allocated. Now, this to some of you say, <coughs> This is pie in the sky. Why would anybody give up water? Well, the thing is, what you don't want is the legal battles to take over because what we've seen in a lot of cases in California, the decisions that judges made just didn't make a lot of sense. And so what you're doing is you're avoiding this sort of haphazard decisions that can be made and, and appeals. And you're trying in the beginning to come up with some type of compromise about how water is used. And, and of course, there, there's other approaches as well. But let's kind of talk about some of these things in terms of their practicality. Okay, again, I've mentioned this before. The water conveyance system costs, the current idea is going to cost about $17 billion. That, of course, likely will go up with the annual cost of about $3 billion. Uh, restoration is going to cost three to four billion that's associated with, uh, with the conveyance and an annual figure of, uh, you know, of 300 to 400 uh, million dollars. But the big cost is gonna be stress or reduction. Okay, and I've already mentioned the Sacramento uh, addition of tertiary treatment uh, um, to uh, reduce ammonium. And this is quite expensive when we look at Red Bluff and Redding and a few of these others and plus other stressors as well, not just ammonium. Uh, and this is going to have an annual cost about one to two billion. So these are big ticket items. I mean, this is not a cheap solution. Uh, I want to mention now one of the take home messages, something's got to be done. We cannot continue just with the status quo and that this is sort of the path that the state is heading down. All right. Look at, let's look at agriculture in terms of water conservation. We have extremely good way, ways of preserving water in agriculture. We have uh, precision irrigation, good drip systems, uh, ways to avoid runoff from uh, agricultural fields, you know, highly sophisticated electronic monitoring of use. And the idea is you want the evapotranspiration, the amount of water that's lost through the plant, equal to the amount of water that's applied. Okay, here's the problem. Whenever agriculture has used any type of water conservation, they take the water savings and they grow more crops. That's really what ends up happening. The water savings is just going for more crops. Uh, if you look at where water comes, 30% is from groundwater that's used in the Central Valley and 60% 
of that groundwater is used in drought. Uh, the irrigation is important because without irrigation, you don't have that recharging of the groundwater. So it seems like you know a, a, an anomaly, but if you don't, if you're reducing the amount of water that you're using, you don't get the recharge of groundwater that you need for agriculture and for, for other uses. Uh, currently in California, and this is an a, a incredible legislative advance that groundwater is now regulated, 13% uh, of the groundwater in the state is overdrafted. So uh, I'm using a, a, a euphemism for the solution to this, reduce the footprint of agriculture. In other words, you take land out of agricultural production. That's one of the things that I think is inevitable. So <clears throat> let's look at groundwater. And I know a lot of you don't, don't like to look at grass, but I'll try to explain this. If we look at the change of groundwater in terms of millions of, of, of acre feet, this is, occurs on an annual basis. We're going from 1925 to 2016. Uh, the, those shaded areas are the dry years uh, compared to the normal or the wet years. Uh, if we look at the Sacramento Valley, we're not actually uh, doing too much drafting of groundwater. It's not too bad. Uh, we look at the Sacramento River, we see that, you know, it's going down uh, annually. Uh, and we look at the Tulare Basin, in other words, from Fresno to Bakersfield, it's going way down. Um, the, in 2014, California, and again, Brown deserves a lot of credit for this, passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And what this does, it gives water agencies time to develop the, uh, their plans to bring the basins into balance. In other words, that the recharging of the groundwater equals the amount of the groundwater that's, that's taken out. Uh, and then they have to achieve this over a 20 year period. This is an absolutely major piece of legislation. California had no idea how much groundwater was being used at the at state level or how much overdrafting there was. So this was a major uh, th accomplishment of the Brown administration in passing this. And you can imagine they tried to do this for years with a lot of, 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 of difficulty. Okay, what about the Colorado River? You know, we think of the Colorado River as also an important source of, source of water. And this you can see in that uh, little map to the left, it uh, it's really is in, in Wyoming and Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona, and of course into Mexico. Uh, if you look at the water supply in the Colorado River, which is that historical supply and use, uh, you can see the, the red, the water use going up, the uh, great fluctuations depending on water cycles, uh, precipitation cycles in terms of the supply. But you look at it from when we go from the present on, the projected demand is it, it probably will follow that increased line, whereas the water supply probably will, will uh, level off. And this isn't even assuming the effects of climate change on that, that, uh, that basin because that will certainly be effect, tremendously affected by, uh, uh, by increased temperatures, increased evaporation. So uh, although it supplies over 60% of the water used annually in Southern California, um, it's about 20% more of that river is used in California than should be. Uh, of course, Mexico gets the, the really the raw end of the, of the deal there, but there's continual legal battles. They talk about the four corners area where those four states come together. It's a constant fight. So what happens is if there's less water in the Colorado, there's going to be more pressure on water in the Delta. Now, this year, there have been a couple of incredible papers that looked at tree rings, historical tree rings, in terms of the history of mega droughts in the Western US. And if you look at that graph of California precipitation, you see it's always bounced all over the place. It's always been highly variable. Uh, one of the big predictions of, uh, of climate change is that it will become even more variable. And if you look at the drought area in California, uh, you see the, with the increasing color, this is the increasing area of intense droughts that have occurred over the last 18 years. Uh, and then of course, you know, look at the, at, the, at the dry canals that are coming. But if you look at this last figure in the bottom, and this is a really interesting uh, one to look at, where you're going back and you're using tree rings to look at when we've had extended periods of drought. And the area above that line is wetter than average, the area below is drier than average. 
and you see these mega droughts that you know lasted for 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 you know in some cases over a century and the the question is of course are we going into a mega drought now or if we just is is this just variability uh but this is again something that's that's uh been very, very useful. And, you know, I, I also want to point out, you know, this is, these are models that we see when we, we, we go beyond this. And, you know, models are useful, but of course they're all wrong, but they can tell you a lot. And when you find out what's wrong about them is when they really can be, become even more valuable. So this is, is one of the things, you know, when you see models being used, whether it's by, about climate change or anything else, remember that they're all based on assumptions and, and probably any one of them is going to be wrong. But together, especially when we find out what's wrong with them, they become much, much more useful. All right, let's talk about desalination because this is something that everybody, you know, is very, very hopeful about, my, myself included, uh, and has been used very, very effectively in some countries. Uh, the big issue about desal is how much energy it uses. Um, there four main or five main types of uh, desal depending on environmental conditions the uh, uh, multi-stage flash distillation you're basically just putting it to vapor and then you the salt accumulates the fresh water comes out very very high energy use at the other end is uh, reverse osmosis that's the swro and the bwro and again depending on the salinity of the water it uses more or less energy. So if you're using water that's already brackish, maybe, uh, you know, say the ocean has 35,000, 35,000, 35 parts per thousand salinity and brackish water has about 10. If you're using brackish water with, uh, with desal, you don't take as much energy with the 10 parts per thousand as you would with the 35,000. So this is kind of the different approaches that have been used. If we look at how desal is used throughout the world today. Almost all of it is a reverse osmosis where you have a membrane and you're using energy to bring the uh, fresh water across that and then the, uh, the, the salts and the, the minerals remain. Uh, it's a very, very uh, wonderfully simple design. You, if you look in that graph, the cost uh, has dropped down and is, seems to be asymptoting at about uh, now at about that lower level. Uh, which is really what's pushing people into new uh, areas of technology. And the biggest area that we see that's probably going to develop is using biological membranes, where we have tr channel-based transport, just like we have with our own ion systems in our, our bodies involving nanotubes and things like that. So what you have is water, in the case of producing clean water, fresh water, or solutes, in the case of the, the salt, transporting through these protein channels and water uh, is, is becomes less salty through that and ultimately is very, very effective. So this is the future of, of desal. Now, water reuse is a big issue. Um, I, I was part of a grant uh, with uh, Stanford, uh, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State looking on how can we improve water reuse. And it was a very, very large grant. It was about $18 million. It was uh, very, very successful because we looked at countries like Israel and actually we, we, we brought people from Israel to talk about this. Israel reuses 86% of its uh, water. In other words, the sewage water is treated for reuse at about 86%. Uh, in Singapore, it's even higher than that. So they use a combination of, of um, uh, desal and water reuse. But basically it's because they have to. They really don't have the water supplies that they can use. So they've had to develop technologies. Now I'm just going to mention in, in, in Israel it was a very, very interesting problem that they had because uh, the Talmud, uh, the religious laws, uh, forbid the drinking of polluted water. And so they, how they came uh, around that was they um, uh, had rabbis agree that we consume crop products that can be considered polluted, such as olives, the alkaloids and olives are, are, are totally unedible. And that if you dilute olives enough, any homemade olive uh, maker has all this, these techniques for doing it, uh, the olives, the alkaloids drain out and you, and you can um, eat them, you can cure them. Well, this is what they decided to do uh, in es establishing how the Talmud could um, uh, be rationalized in terms of reuse of water. 
And what they did was they used dilution factors. Now, what's interesting is the Koran also prohibits the use of drinking of polluted water, but the imams couldn't agree on, on anything. So what you have outside of Gaza is a huge um, water reuse plant that is not being used to put clean water in Gaza. And Gaza, of course, is one of the huge environmental uh, issues that uh, uh, is worldwide in terms of the, the humanitarian catastrophe for lack of, of, for lack of water. Uh, the other thing, though, is the contaminants of emerging concern. You know, these, these, a lot of these are things like birth control pills, but it's also, you know, the, some of the plastic byproducts, uh, you know, uh, pesticides, of course, are very well acknowledged as, as being uh, of concern. But these are the two things that seem to be inhibiting the adoption of, uh, of, of water reuse around the world. But in California, it's really, uh, it's environmental considerations, public health considerations. And I think this is going to be a huge uphill battle in terms of water reuse from, from sewage. Um, in the near Pacifica, we did a pilot study where we took water out of a sewage treatment plant to restore a stream. And for environmental issues, that worked out fine. Um, but also, we haven't been able to duplicate that in very many places uh, because of public concerns and children playing in, in streams and things like that. So uh, again, we look at uh, raw sewage and the high particulates, uh, the plant effluents, and then the reclaimed water, which is, 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 is clean. And then of course is treated uh, with um, uh, chlorine or some other disinfectant. Okay, so if we look at desal in California, and that's the, if you just look at that map for, for a minute, uh, there's a lot of proposed plants. These are all the plants that are in blue. Um, there's only one, it, one plant that is completely dependent, uh, one, one city that's completely dependent on desal, and that's Sand City in uh, near Monterey, and, but it only has 365 people. So uh, all the rest you see, even in terms of some of these Santa Catalina and, uh, and some of these other islands, there are other sources that, uh, that are used, that they're you know, collecting rainwater and a variety of, of, of other features, including some uh, uh, reuse for environmental purposes. But the biggest plant is in Carlsbad. This is the one in San, near San Diego. It's the largest desalination facility in the, in the, in the United States. And it, the idea is that it'll produce seven to 8% of San Diego County's water. And this is a, a picture of the plant, which you see there. Uh, whether it will be used as anticipated for in that graph of desalinization, where you also depend on groundwater and recycled water and local surface water, uh, water coming through uh, from Northern California, water from Metropolitan Water District, which of course comes from the Colorado River and, and uh, Northern California, whether that's actually gonna be used like this or it's gonna be for um, mainly for emergency supplies, like some of the ones in, uh, like the plant in Cambria, near Santa Barbara will be used for that. Uh, the intention is certainly to use this and uh, we'll have to see what, what, what happens. But this is the, uh, the, the current state of the art in how desalinization will be done in California. <clears throat> I, there's a lot of material on this, but I want you to be able to not just listen to me, but to read at the same time how desalinization works. And this is the plan for the Carlsblad plant near Southern California, in, near San Diego. You take about 100 million gallons of water into the plant per day, okay? So you're taking a huge amount of salt water in. You filter it through grand and, and gravel and sand, which is really the same way we treat sewage water. Uh, basically, the particulates adhere to that, get caught into the filters. And then the next step is classic desalinization, reverse uh, osmosis. So half of the water that's taken in actually produces potable water, drinking water. The rest you have a, as consecrated brine. But what you have to do before you can dilute it in the ocean is you have to dilute the water with some of the potable water. In other words, you can't just dump salty water because what this does is produce dead zones in the ocean. So you have to use some of the water that you take out of salt water that's potable, it's drinkable, and put it back in to dilute the salt water. Uh, 
So currently, they most plants that are, are in the uh, um, in the world, especially in the big ones, of course, are in. I, I visited one in Kuwait uh, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, they're dumping it in at about 50% extra salt. And that's a huge problem because you're getting dead zones in the ocean. Because when you have a brine that's high saline, it doesn't mix well, it's, it's dense. I don't know if you've ever uh, gone into the Dead Sea where you, know, you can see how dense that water is because of the, the high salinity. Well, let's look at how effective desal is. If you, if you take out the startup costs, okay, that, that's, that's a big amount of money. But if you take that out, they should be, water should be about 100 to 200 more than recycled water. And, but of course, people don't want to drink recycled water anyway. You probably have to use that for environmental purposes. About 1,000 to 1,000 more than reservoir water. In other words, water that's already stored that would include groundwater. But it could be less, maybe 100 to $200 less, or at least, at least a wash in terms of importing water from uh, through the canals. Uh, this may all change depend on, depending on the cost of water that's gonna go through because remember uh, metropolitan water is essentially a distributor of water. Uh, they have to recoup their costs. So water will go up uh, in Southern California. And again, to repeat myself, Southern California starts at Fremont uh, and this is gonna be a very, very big thing. So I wanna kind of, Thank you, first of all, for listening. I, I've got a couple of take home messages that you probably have, have heard already. Uh, one of which is that nobody in the future is going to get as much water as they want. Uh, there's going to be compromises. There's going to be increased pricing of water. Um, you know, for example, for d domestic water, for our water supplies um, uh, that we use in our homes, uh, w water is charged at kind of a funny metric. It's acre feet. So it's one acre of land, one foot deep. We're paying about $3,500 to $4,000 an acre foot for water that we use at home. And an acre foot is about 385,000 gallons, just to, if, if, you can, if that helps. Uh, where some agriculture, depending on water rights, is paying the cost of pumping, which maybe is 15 to you know, $75 an, an, an acre foot. So there's gonna have to be some adjustment on pricing of water. Uh, that's, that's the first thing. Agricultural land is going to have to be taken out of production. I think what they're going to take out is uh, the most saline water, the water that's not, uh, saline land, the water that's not really useful anyway. And they're going to talk about that as, as you know, as, as putting uh, land back into environmental uses. Uh, that's fine. But I do think that, that we're going to see a, a big decrease in, uh, in agricultural water. Um, I think voluntary agreements, if they ever can work, are a great way to go in the future. Um, I'm not super optimistic about them, I'm not even optimistic, but I, I, I like the fact that they're going on. And I think the final point I want to make is when we talk about the Delta, if you read that article in the San Francisco Chronicle last Sunday, if you think about many of the regions in California where you have the family farms and you have the tradition of family farms, we're talking about way of life, and that probably is even a bigger driver than profits. So thank you very much. Uh, if anybody would like my uh, slides, I'll gladly, uh, my email is simple, resh at berkeley.edu. Uh, I'll gladly send uh, copies of them, or if you have any, any uh, questions that you think could be could be answered, but I guess we have- uh, uh, Dr. Questions. Resch, I, I can read you the questions. Okay. We have several. Um, however, you've already covered some of them, so we'll try to weed those out. Uh, first one is from Barbara, right at the beginning of your presentation. Is the information in David Sedlak's book, Water 4.0, published 2014, reasonably current? Ah, uh, well, this is a, a difficult question, you know, the full disclosure uh, that now you're seeing. And in, in, uh, uh, David Sedlak and I had it, were, were part of the same grant on water reuse, and uh, uh, he's a f outstanding water chemist scientist. So yes, I would say it's uh, it, it still is very very valuable, and certainly, I think one of the best things out there. Okay. I, I I suspect he'll revise it uh, as time goes on, but yeah, I really would recommend that. Okay, the next question is from Edward. He says, "Does agriculture include marijuana? If so, I would think percent of GDP is higher than two percent." 
Well, you know, that's interesting is uh, marijuana in, uh, you know, that has been a big issue in, especially along the, the North coast, because what you find is that, uh, uh, you know, small streams, which are headwaters for, uh, for tr coho salmon, for trout and things like that are, um, are being diverted uh, into uh, fields. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that un unlike the traditional small scale marijuana, where you're planting in soil, they're bringing in truckloads of soil and that of course gets washed into the streams. Uh, so there's a big environmental cost. There's a human cost. You know, one of our, our Berkeley students was, was killed accidentally uh, setting off a tripwire in a marijuana farm when, when he was doing a, a forestry survey for a class. Uh, yeah. So there's all these costs. Um, estimates are that you could take all the marijuana that's currently grown in California and with high tech solutions, grow it in on 500 acres in the Central Valley. That it, it's, it's, it's not that much. Now, the cost of, 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 of marijuana, that, that's not figured in the one to 2%. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, the cost of marijuana depends on, you know, for example, if it's small scale distributors, if it's drug cartels from Mexico, if legal sales are too high, will they drive up the, the sales? Uh, I would venture to say we're still talking maybe at most slightly over 2%, even though it's the biggest cash crop in California. I, I would say that because uh, uh, what's going to happen is it's grown very, very um, uh, effectively in, in aquaculture. Is, is, you know, uh, I, I once was driving down University Avenue in Berkeley, and my wife and I wanted to buy some marigolds and went into one of these uh, uh, places that are selling, you know, uh, uh, lights for marijuana cultivation. And I asked about marigolds and the guy looked at me like I was crazy, you know, uh, but it, it's, it's very, very easy to be done on, on an industrial scale. So I, 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 to tell you the truth, I'm not sure, but this is my gut feeling when I say it would, it would, it would push it up more, but there's so many factors in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the sale, the price of marijuana and the, and the incomes. Yeah. Uh, Paul wants to know, this is a completely different path we're going on, is if, if you know the magnitude of water used to fight fires. Ah, that's very interesting. No, I don't know, actually. I do know that uh, with, when they can do aerial, uh, uh, they don't use they, water as much as they use fire troll, which is this red compound that you see, see coming out of, out of the plains. I would think that it's probably not that great because, you know, a lot of these areas where there's uh, um, fires right now, I mean, they're diverting water out of small streams. They are going to reservoirs and using, you know, dipping the, the plains and to take water up to, to, to drop. But I, it's, it's an in interesting question. Um, I have uh, uh, colleagues in forestry that probably have a better answer, handle on how much it is, but I wouldn't think it's that much. And again, it's episodic. You know, it's only certain times of the year. Of course, now it's the time when the streams are driest uh, and not every year. Okay. Um, Arthur uh, asked about desalinization, which I believe you've covered, but except for the aspect of teaching crops to grow in saltier water. Do you know anything about that? Or is that more of a horticultural question? A, a exception of, I'm sorry, what? Uh, teaching crops to grow oh, okay. in saltier water. Yeah, well, I, you know, th this is what you see the, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, um, Norman Borlaug with the Green Revolution. The whole idea is using, you know, crop uh, um, modifications. In other words, the uh, uh, natural evolution of crops. Uh, now we're using it by genetic engineering. Uh, uh, the idea of uh, rice, we have strains of rice that require less water. Uh, we have a variety of things. Yeah, so I think this is being done already. Um, one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting, if you, if you look at uh, GMO crops, although they are more economic in some respects, uh, the yields, the plant yields for these are turning out not to be uh, any better than traditional breeding. So I think the, what we're going to see is more traditional breeding. This was a, a National Academy of Sciences report that pointed out that the foods were safe to eat but that really in terms of, of yields, they're oftentimes not as, as great because of increased fer fertilizers, increased pesticides. Okay, John is asking, can you talk about 
two economic issues. Bureau of Reclamation customers in the San Joaquin Valley use ruses to circumvent the acreage limitations and get subsidized water for huge farms. Also, the owner of Paramount Farms in Southern California buys ag water at lower rates, banks it, and then sells it to cities at a much higher rate. Yeah. Is this a legal use of taxpayer subsidized water? Ooh, right. that, that last part's a little editorial, so I, I, All right, a little. I, I agree with them, but uh, there was a, 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 a cotton grower named Jim Boswell that wrote a book called King of Cotton, and he was the first person to realize that money in, is not from cotton. Money is in banking water and storing water. Uh, this, is, this was, you know, uh, you know, a crop like cotton probably shouldn't be grown in California anyway, uh, really shouldn't uh, do that. Um, is it legal? You know, I, I think, you know, one of the, the things that I, I used to advise, you know, people about if their sons were interested in becoming attorneys is to have them go into water law because it's, it's so contentious and everything. But one of the things I've realized over time is that actually uh, most of the water lawyers are working for you know, the big major agricultural uh, 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 farmers, the major, major, major corporations, and also uh, fighting against uh, incursions on their water rights. So it turns out that it's uh, uh, not, there's not a need for that many, but I would add that I think the editorial comment that he made is, is this, if not legal, is it right that they do that? It certainly isn't. You know, the Freant Dam was built uh, with the idea in the, in the uh, Westlands Water District uh, so that they wouldn't pump groundwater. Well, what they did was they used the water from the Freant Dam and they pumped groundwater. A again, when water is, is, is made available, either by savings or uh, the building of a dam, conservation for agriculture isn't done. You just use it to plant more crops. So I, I I, I, I think that's probably the best answer to, to give. All right. Uh, I believe you've already covered this, but um, with the anticipated rise of sea level, what effects on the salt level and other things in the Delta? Well, you know, the, 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 all the planning in the Delta right now uh, has to have a, a inclusion of climate change effects and, and, and sea level rise. Um, the, uh, certainly the, a lot of the restoration projects that are being done are planning with this 55 inches of sea level rise and surge rise uh, in the Delta. Um, I, I think basically what's gonna happen is that uh, uh, you're gonna have increased salinity issues. You're gonna have habitat issues that you're gonna have to deal with. And I think where this is being acted out right now and where the best planning is being done is in restoration. But they're big, they're big issues, you know. Uh, if, you, if you end up having continual subsidence and you have sea level rise and you have potential for levee breaks, you know, it's not a good situation. Uh, a related question, what's happened from, from Lucy, what's happened to the restoration part of the Delta plans as the conveyance plans have changed? Yeah, under, under Brown, uh, the, he separated the conveyance uh, Let's start over again. Remember under uh, Schwarzenegger, there was a $60 billion project of conveyance and restoration. Brown then separated the conveyance from restoration and he created something called Eco Restore uh, with the idea that restoration would be uh, parallel and uh, but not directly hooked to the cost of the uh, of the project so that the payment would not come out of the users for that. It would come out of state funds and, and perhaps a variety of other funds from the users. Uh, currently, Eco Restore is still exists, but it's not at the level that it was under either of the two previous plans. So restoration is still there. They are doing restoration. I mean, restoration is such a costly uh, amount of uh, uh, you know, per, 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 per mile or per yard, whatever you want to think of it, that it's, it's now uh, on the back burner. I suspect with the economic issues of the state, it's going to continue to be. Uh, I believe you covered this uh, somewhat. Who opposed the tunnels and why? What's your opinion on this? 
Okay, this is, this is again, probably not going to make anybody happy. Uh, the, the tunnels were proposed by Schwarzenegger. Uh, Brown embraced them very, very uh, quickly. Um, people throughout the state were opposed to it from, the, from e either plan of a double tunnel or single tunnel. Uh, people that live in the Delta were opposed to it. Some fishing groups were opposed to it. Some environmental groups. Some environmental groups weren't. I, I, you have to add that in, too. My feeling is that we are going to need some type of, of improved way of getting water through the Delta in the future. That's clear. To me, there's no doubt about that. The fact that you now have a single tunnel is, makes a lot of people happier. For one thing, when you had two tunnels, especially they were larger tunnels with more water, even though you said you weren't going to take the water, you always had the option of taking it. With a single tunnel, you're looking at a limited amount of water. Also, the fact we're going to be planning this and building this over the next 17 years. So I would rather do it when we have time to consider it, when we can look at, at various options, when we can do what's called adaptive management, which is what the process that's being done in the Delta, where you plan, do, and you revise, uh, rather than doing it in a rush, because I think down the road, you're gonna, they're going to have to do this. And I'd rather do it with planning than with no planning at all. So okay. I, I'm very pleased that we have a single tunnel instead of two tunnels. Um, and I think most of my colleagues that I work with prefer this, but I would say that the single tunnel is not universally embraced. I personally think it's a good thing that we should be doing now. Okay. Um, Edward says the Delta conveyance project reminds him of the Battle of the Peripheral Can Canal in the 1970s. He doesn't see much progress and he doesn't expect any progress, stalemate, stalemate among the parties. Do you agree? Yes well, or no? You know, he's right about that. And who was the governor during the Peripheral Canal? Jerry Brown. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the, the, the impact of the tunnels relative to the Peripheral Canal in terms of land use and and a variety of other factors is, is far less. So I, you know, had we gone through with a peripheral canal, you know, 30 some years ago, I, I think we would have, uh, you know, we would be used to it by now. Uh, we would have been tinkering with it in terms of how much water we have go through it, just like we will be with the tunnels. Uh, but he's right. This is basically an underground version with a little less impact. 35, the tunnels are, you know, roughly 30 um, feet in diameter, 30, 32 feet in diameter. So, but it's, it's, it's this, this similar idea. It's, he's right. Okay. Uh, Amy, and, and by the way, the idea is not going to go away. If we don't do if the tunnels end up getting delayed, it's going to, it's going to come back again and again. There's no choice. Okay. Uh, Amy says, I attended a presentation a few years ago by the head of the California Water Department. She said there are more than 500 towns in Southern Cal where if one turns on the tap, no water comes out. Is this still the case? Are there towns without water in Northern California? She felt that the best solution was better management of groundwater. Do you know what the status is of getting running, running water to these towns? Yeah, well, that, that of course is the, the, she's emphasized the importance of the Groundwater Act where we didn't have any, any idea about that. We know, Water is, is really an environmental justice issue because, you know, during the drought, we saw all these villages, mainly of, uh, you know, of, of, of minorities that were, had, had no clean water, that they had to, had to pump the, bring the water in, in, in trucks and pump it in. And, and yet many of these were located near enough to wealthy communities that just didn't want to bring their water needs into theirs. And so you had adjacent communities where some had an overabundance of, 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 or at least an abundance of water that they, they were using, whereas others, others had none. So, uh, yeah, I think that the, the, um, the, the head of water resources, I'm not sure who it was at that time, I, there's a few, that no date was given, but, but yeah, that was, the, they always wanted to monitor groundwater. That, that was always the big thing. Uh, because, you know, so much of agriculture depends on it and the recharge in terms of getting, uh, you know, the, the, the stopping the subsidence, getting the, um, uh, the, the water, a, a, any kind of purification depends on groundwater. Yeah. Good question. Um, Good question. Yeah, Gloria and Doug actually are both asking about taking significant part of agriculture out of the state to areas that have more water. And Doug also is asking, excuse me, 
<clears throat> what the economic and political implications are of uh, taking ag land out of production. Well, you know, one of the reasons that we can have asparagus year round is that we get, get it from all over the world, you know, uh, um, uh, where there's a shortage of, uh, of, of a local crop, uh, we get it from somewhere else. So in January, you can get uh, pineapples from Tahiti. Uh, it, there's globalization of, of, of agriculture already. So uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't see this as, I mean, there are certainly political ramifications in that the, the California farmers are, are certainly an incredibly effective political group. Uh, again, far more than their, um, than their percent of the economy would, 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 would represent. Partially, it's because of the fact that it's so dispersed throughout the state in terms of the assembly and the uh, uh, and the Senate, state Senate. Um, I, I I I see this happening already. You know, uh, one of the things they do in Europe that's interesting is they tell you where the crop, where the the fruits and the vegetables are coming what, from, what country. Some of the supermarkets do this. They'll say these asparagus are from Mexico. Um, one of the things I remember somebody telling me from the Delta and talking to a Delta farmer once, and he said, you know. There are unique things that we grow here. Uh, if farming ends in the Delta, where are we going to get white asparagus from? Well, you know, when you see white asparagus sometimes now, it's coming from France or it's coming from Spain. Uh, I just think there's globalization of, of, of agriculture. Is this going to make anybody in California happy that uh, from the farming community? I doubt it. Um, you know, in terms of just, just look with the... Uh, with the limitations on soy going to China, the political implications of that once, uh, once the tariffs are put on that. Because we're getting short on time, I'm gonna to try to condense some of these or uh, questions. Doug and Barbara are asking questions about, um, excuse me, Ray and Barbara. First of all, Ray is asking about the move, are there movements to educate the public and encourage transitions away from water heavy foods, e.g. almonds, pistachios, varieties, tangerines. And Barbara is asking, should we prohibit rice and almonds from California agriculture, uh, water heavy? <laughs> well, you know, what, what, uh, what, almonds is a wonderful example because one of my colleagues that's an engineer at Davis, uh, whenever he goes to, uh, he's consulting overseas or he's going to movies overseas, he always buys almonds there and brings them back. He's repatriating the almonds to California. And what he's showing by that is most of the almonds actually are exported. That, that's, that's really the, you know, a, a large, large market. Um, should we not be growing almonds? You know, I mean, I think we should be paying more for the water that's using to, uh, uh, to grow almonds. Um, I, I would mention that, you know, the, the former head of war, water rights in California, who's now retired uh, in a private conversation with a group of people that were involved in water, said that what needs to be done is that all the water rights in California need to be re-adjudicated or adjudicated, uh, whatever the correct term would be. And in Australia, they did this after the millennial drought, you know, the 10 years of drought all of the water rights that people were depending on uh, were, were adjudicated. They had to be reconsidered. And uh, although this would be an incredibly unpopular move by farmers in California, uh, because if you have senior water rights versus junior rights, you know, um, uh, original, water rights in California is a really complicated issue, but it comes down to the fact that um, the, so much of the land was owned by the government that rather than using riparian rights like they used in Europe or they used in the Eastern US, they said, well, let's use prior use. If you've been using it for a long time, you get to keep it. And at, this, at the time it made sense, uh, but this is, is really you know, the big issue. So really to get to, get to that question about, should we be going rice? Should we be uh, growing almonds? Uh, you know, most of the rice is exported. You know, it's, it's being sent to Asia. Uh, it's, it's you know, through um, uh, plant breeding, you have rice uh, uh, stands that, uh, that you use less water. Um, also, of course, you have, uh, um, you know, the issue of air pollution from burning the, the stubble. I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things with, with, with crops. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to see, see more regulation of, uh, 
of crops. You know, the, uh, I mean, we po politics and growing crops have been uh, part of the United States for, you know, a long time. You know, we, we opposed the Suez Canal because we were afraid that uh, cotton would be grown cheaper in Egypt than when they could produce it in the Southern United States. So that's, that's what uh, sent uh, Nasser to, to Russia to build the uh, Suez Canal. So we, 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 we always had these, these issues. For sure, cotton, I'd like to see go. That for sure. You know, as, as cotton farmers, the old guys will tell you, you know, unless you see a couple of dead birds in the field, you're not spraying enough. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure that we could go on for another half an hour uh, because of the volume of questions that we have. But unfortunately, we're not going to get to all of them. But I, I'm going to give you the ringer right now which is, is, I only see once in here, do you think that drinking water may prove to be a source of COVID infection? Well, let me answer this by saying, certainly sewage water has shown to be a source of COVID infections. Uh, one of the things that you're seeing all over the state, I mean, Berkeley is doing it, a huge project of looking at, uh, uh, at sewage effluents from various plants and looking at the prevalence of, uh, of the COVID virus. Uh, um, you know, I mean, between the treatments, the, uh, you know, the, the, the bromide and everything else that are, that are being used, the um, chloramines, chlorine, um, I'm sure this is being, being looked at. I, 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 let's say probably like the person asking the question, I hope the answer is no. But certainly sewage water is. So with recycled water, you do have that, have that potential problem. Getting viruses out is the most difficult. Well, it's 1230. That is the end of our webinar. I want to thank Dr. Resch for his presentation, which was excellent. Um, your email, again, is resch at berkeley.edu. At berkeley and if you would like a copy of his slides, just send him an email. And you can also email um, me, bbaron, at covia.org if you would like a copy of the or a recording of the presentation, a link to the recording. Thanks everybody for joining us today and we will see you in October for our next webinar, UC Retiree Learning Series. Thank you very much.